This is the Leadership Podcast. Our mission is to reverse engineer the leadership aspects of human peak performance. We are talking to accomplished leaders, maverick scientists, innovators, and biohackers in order to unlock the secrets of long-lasting optimum performance and help people to achieve effortless success in their lives. The host of the Leadership Podcast is Imre Porkolab, the director of MCC's Academy for Leading Change. Good day for everyone. Uh, this is the Leadership Podcast, and this is a very special episode, uh, and it would be very difficult to, to introduce Jeff Hudson Cyril, our next guest on the show, and he's an independent digital non-executive director, C-suite executive, serial business advisor for growth phase tech companies, best-selling author, doing so many things, uh, top 250 Harvard Business School uh, think leader authority and, and and the list just goes on and I, I could spend the whole podcast you know just 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 reading the Bible. but how, how would you describe yourself Jeff I mean in in, in a very short sentence um, very short sentence I think it's clear to say I'm a 30 year executive serial business advisor for growth phase companies um, you're quite correct I've had a distinguished career around c-suite um, executive uh, around both private and public limited companies. Um, I've been a non-executive director for probably the last 13 years. I have a big passion in regulation, technology, internet security, and I am an author um, and a thought leader. Um, my last book was uh, Purposeful Discussions, which was a bestseller. And um, I'm moving swiftly to 2022 with my business partner, uh, Mark Herbert in the US. Um, we've just written our latest book, which will be published this year, which is called the trust paradigm. So we're very excited about that. But I think that's probably the easiest way to uh, describe my experiences. There's there's much more, but uh, keeping it simplistic. Yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm sure everyone is asking you about the uh, the freedom after the sharks. But we're going <laughs> to dig deeper into your book, Purposeful Discussions, because I think that's a stellar read. But but before we do that, we normally here at the Leadership Podcast, we we, we try to figure out, you know. Uh, how how did you become what, what, what you are? I mean, this is a, a, an exemplary, really stellar track record. How, how do you you know keep up with the uh, the tempo of this rapidly changing world? And what what's what's the secret source of of this very successful life that you're leading? I, I would like to say that um, adversity. We we are we are all shaped by our own individual experiences, as as you're quite. Rightly so. Uh, look, I wanted to be Royal Air Force. I wanted to be a pilot, and I ended up a, as an executive at Citibank. Um, it's quite a, a, a change, um, but they saw something in, from an engineering mindset which which enabled me to do that. Um, so I think Citibank was good for me in many ways. It was discipline. Um, it was the examinations that I took whilst I was at the bank, which we were talking pre-FSA days in those days. So there was a lot of work to do. But I think my journey, and I don't call it my career, I very much call it the journey. And um, leaving the bank and then going you know, working internationally, um, you know, for many, many years around major change programs and, and taking uh, businesses through trajectories of growth and, and and programs globally and internationally fortune 100 companies was very exciting before then deploying myself through a very successful um executive suite suite career um now you know i would say now you know, the learnings that i had uh from all of those successful years in business have created what i am today and and you know and i today is very much a mix between between non-executive director roles, which I have, uh, I sit on the board for for a, a company uh, which is, has global technology, and another uh, global and international company which is um, a metaverse company in Australia, London. So I, that that maintains. I'm still doing a lot of board advisory, uh, but also at the same time with consultancy. Uh, IBEM, I'm very much uh, supporting and helping companies around some of the biggest issues in business today around strategy, management support, you know, uh, strategic partnerships, and obviously executive board. So, you know, th those skill sets, um, all those experiences, uh, and the wisdom, as it were, because you know, I wrote recently about um, trust intelligence, which and and some people are not even aware of wisdom intelligence that we need to work with. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
everyone's aware of EQ, IQ, um, and SI. And I think spiritual intelligence is important. Duke's University in America started to talk about DI, which is decency intelligence. Um, but I think that when you start looking at trust intelligence, um, you encapsulate all of the intelligences. And I think that we've got to be a bit more proactive in that way. But uh, look, I'm, I'm shaped by the experiences I've, I've had. I'm, I'm graced by God to be able to have the life I've had today and the journey that I've had. It's by far, it's not over. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I've still got much work to do uh, in the field. But I've, I must say that I have enjoyed every second um, of my career and my life. Um, and uh, as I said to you previously, there's much more to come. You mentioned the Royal Air Force. I mean, and, and from a, from a leadership perspective, how, how how do you see you know the experiences that the military uh, sort of gives people, and and especially at a very young age, because you have to take care of of of, of, of people and in, uh, in in very uncertain situations. And and how does that translate into the uh, the business life? Um, I think that I think that there was a lot of good grounding there. I mean. As I said before, being at uh, Royal Air Force School um, taught me a lot, a lot around survival skills. Um, people talk about, you know, survival and thrival in in this area. I mean, one thing I make very clear: um, I do not, I don't see the last 24 months as as a, a significant world event because there's been many world events that have taken place and shaped people. You know, I rem you know, you remember Black Friday, you know, uh, we, we don't forget that. Um, we don't forget SARS and Ebola. We don't forget the double dip of 2008 and 2009, not to mention, you know, um, other world events, you know, we had Spanish flu, obviously, and, and we've had earthquakes, uh, which for some, it's a major tragedy. It's a major life changing for others. It's the start of something new. So I think that I was always uh, using thought leadership to tell and to guide and to coach people through a very important period of time in the last 24 months to say, this is an opportunity to yeah. reset. This is an opportunity to build. But back to your original question. Um, I'm, I believe in respect. I believe in honor. Uh, and, and I believe in, in team operation. We recently, I've been working very heavily with a lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army, um, um, you know, Oak, Oakland. Um, and I have been discussing, uh, trust and we've been discussing what, what creates trust in, in the military and also organizations. And I've written, a lawful lot around resiliency. Um, I've worked with uh, government agencies around the world and, and I've had the privilege of being able to work with uh, some ex-naval SEALs um, at a very senior level. So when you speak to them, they, they speak with a completely different gravitas. They speak That's right. With, they speak with, uh, with that wisdom. Um, they're able to make solid decisions based on a foundation of beliefs and, and values, which I'm afraid to say, whilst I see there is a trans, there's definitely transfer from, from that world, the military and leadership to, um, to our world, which is the commercial world. Very few people have possessed those skills. Um, and when, uh, and when the 24 months, as an example, that a particular event, that we had, um, you're looking to leadership to make better decisions. You're looking for a leader to actually say, this is the decisions that we're about to make and we are going to drive forward. What you had was a lot of people that were out completely out of their depth and no big surprise. I mean, the McKinsey research, which everybody reads, PwC, global leadership, CEO research, um, you know, it's the same numbers that keep coming up that you know, 14 and a half thousand businesses globally and internationally have been surveyed and interviewed. Um, but only 84%, they couldn't, uh, manage a change in, 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 in the environment or trends or, or, or performance, but only 16% could actually stand up. Why, why do you think is, 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 is there a knowledge out there, you know, how to do this or, or this is not a cookie cutter approach and every, every company, every leader is different. And, and that's why it's really difficult to, to actually transition and, 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 and make successful change happen. I, uh, I quote from a previous podcast that I did a few weeks ago, that it is an honor and a privilege to be a leader. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I, I actually love leadership. I enjoy leadership. Um, and the fact is there are people that are put into positions um, where they shouldn't really be. Um, and I'm afraid to say it's, it's, um, it's the emotional wake of transformation. You, you, may, you may want the title, but do you have the skills to actually execute? Um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And we're going to transition to your book. But before we do that, I, I have one, one more question that's nagging me. And, and this, is, this is sort of part of your book as well, time management. Uh, how do you manage your time? Just, just please Sorry. enlighten us. Did you say micromanagement? Or we your, your, your career management. I mean, you have mentioned so many things that, that you're juggling, you know, and, and you're dealing with. How, how is it possible? I, I love what I do. I, I love my life. I'm great. I said earlier that, um, you know, I'm gratified by the people that I have around me. I, I am completely inspired by the people that I work with. You know, um, my co-principal in my business, Douglas, is amazing. Um, the chair people that I work with in the non-exec roles are amazing. And, and they are motivating and they enable me to be the person I am today. Um, my partner is amazing. You know, she, she's been um, very supportive of everything that um, yeah, that's very important, and, and that's incredibly important. And, you know, when you feel that level of united values and belief systems and working together to achieve things together, um, I can only say that 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 is an inspiration to do more. Um, I, I do I get I do have early mornings and I do have late nights. Um, but I don't consider it, uh, a, you know, a, a role or a career. It's my journey. And um, I have a responsibility to my people and the companies that I serve and, more importantly, the people that I work with. But I must say, um, you know, um, I'm working with some incredibly brilliant people and that makes my life so much more enjoyable. Hmm. You, uh, in the book, you mentioned that, uh, according to a research, CEO, CEOs of top five uh, leadership attributes uh, are retaining and delivering, uh, developing talent, managing complexity, leading change, leading with integrity, and having an entrepreneurial mindset. But here at MCC, we, we are also uh, very much about talent management, but uh, this is probably for a reason, you know, on the, on the top of this, this list, and this is becoming harder and, and, and harder. And, and what you have expressed so far, you know, the integrity uh, things and, and a credible leader has a huge, huge role in, in, in companies in, 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 you know, bringing talent in and actually retaining talent. Can you share some of, of, of the insights yeah, that you have? I can, I've got two, two things I'd like to share with you on this, which I think is incredibly important. The first is if you look at, I want to go back to trust. Um, if you look at what builds trust, okay, number one, it's listening. Okay. So we need, as a leader, you need to be an effective listener, especially today more, more than ever. But equally, if you're listening, you've got to be empathetic. So you've, you've got to have compassion, uh, to your people. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure that unless you can listen and you can be empathetic, um, that you can actually effectively, um, you know, understand people. And therefore, in order to communicate, you need to have those characteristics put in because that will build purpose, that will build trust. And there are very few leaders that I've ever met in my life that carry um, those uh, those skills. I'm working with, um, you know, um, uh, a couple of very good leaders that do possess those and and that does make a difference but globally internationally um you know you could actually say irrespective of the last 24 months how people were leading more importantly how were they communicating or not as the case may be we've seen we've seen the great resign right? we've seen the great resign um that could have been um uh, due, uh, due to the fact that a lot of People were working from home, which gave them more introspection about what they're really doing in their life. So, you know, do, do I do I have a? There was a great book, the Harvard uh, professor, 
from two professors, one from the administration, one from uh, human cognitive um, biases, wrote a book called Driven many years ago, a very interesting book, and it was all around what drives we have as individuals. Uh, do, do we have a drive to learn? Do we have a do I have a uh, drive to acquire? Do we have a drive to educate, etc.? Uh, and it was very much you know looking at left brain, right brain, and how the brain functions. But I think introspection, we, we don't have enough time for that. What what working from home uh, afforded us was the ability to actually think about what we were doing and whether it it, it demanded purpose, and more importantly, whether whether that was something that people were motivated and wanted to do. So we saw this massive uproar on, on the Great Resign, which I think was very unfortunate um, for some. Um, but now we're going back to the office. And as you can see, I, I'm not sure if you, if you saw the Financial Times um, recently, uh, today or yesterday, but you can see a huge spike in the people returning back to work. And suddenly you've got that socialite interaction, learning is starting to form uh, a massive bias now, uh, development. And, and you know, these are important characteristics. Um, George R. R. Martin once said, the man that, that reads one book lives one life. Yeah, that's right. That reads a thousand books will live a thousand lives. Um, I've never stopped reading. <laughs> yeah, I write, you know, and in some respects, when I write, you know, it puts me off reading uh, when I'm actually writing a book. But actually, um, um, the, the, the honest truth is that, uh, that, you know, you've got to have that open mindset. Um, Carol Dwack, you know, my, the, the book mindset, brilliant book. Yes. Um, many before she wrote that book, many people were struggling with how how we work, how we operate, how our mind works, what, what, what builds uh, trust, as it were, through, through behavior. Um, so the book has been, uh, not, you know, worldly and globally acclaimed, but also all this information, all this data, uh, you know, and I talked to you about knowledge and learning a little bit. It's so important that, that, that it's not the data it's actually the ability to apply that to our individual lives that makes the big difference. And because it will make a big difference and leadership, I, I consider leadership in government. I think I consider leadership in business. I also consider leadership in our everyday lives, but most importantly in the family, yeah. you've got to have leadership. So therefore when you start, you can't, family, you can't have, you know, one without the other, you have to find yeah. that balance. And, and, and most people, especially leaders that I talk to, they are really struggling because, you know, once you focus on one more then the other one suffers. Always, but you, you've got to learn, learn through everyday interactions. That could mean your wife. It could mean your partner. It could mean your girlfriend, boyfriend. It could mean your, it could mean at work. It could actually mean one of your peers. It could mean your line manager. It could be your CEO. Um, equally, we, we always used to look to government for, for direction, for inspired direction for the people. So leadership's everywhere. Right. And, and that's a bit, we've got to get that bit right. And, and, yeah, and, 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 and let, let me just uh, circle back to, uh, to, I mean, purposeful discussions is about, you know, uh, human relationships. And I have two follow up questions on what you have so far is, is when we had COVID and, and as you said, you know, people have done a lot of online meetings. I mean, this purposeful listening that you're talking to about is is it possible online as well because it's more about intent and it's not about the platform and secondly can can it be taught because you know there are many listeners here who might say okay i have no idea what you're talking about but can i can i learn about it and and can i be that sort of leader who, who is who is getting better and better at it um I believe you can. So I'm, you know, one of my um, very good colleagues, um, and uh, I've actually mentioned um, Colin Smith in my new book. Mm -hmm. um, he's AKA the Lister. He trains listening for people, and he has touched people's lives um, by a magnitude of like a thousand as a direct result of, you know, helping and supporting people. Because you know, without listening, you know you're going to find it incredibly difficult. This is not just a 24 month thing. This is a, this is a lifetime thing because I'm not just talking about listening to people. I'm also talking about listening inside of us. Right. And that means a internal external 
okay, alignment that needs to come together in order to be a better human being. Um, and that might sound a little bit sort of self-conscious in what I've just said, but I think that that is incredibly important. We don't listen to our intu intuition enough. It's a bit like saying going to work. People that go to work just for the paycheck, I, I believe that their careers are are over quite quickly. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a very very important thought in there. And actually, here at the uh, the Leadership Academy, we always have a, um, an approach that I mean, you should as a leader, you should uh, you know look deeply into yourself, uh, discover your purpose, uh, find that purpose, find your strengths, and build your career on that those uh, those strengths. And once you are able to change yourself, that's when you can undertake you know bigger tasks. That's when you can inspire other people to to. To, to go and change, you know, certain aspects of, of, let's say, an organization with you. And then eventually you might become, you know, a person who can change the world. But it, it, it all starts with the first step of, of looking in the mirror, look, looking at all those uh, shadows that are lurking uh, inside of us, embracing them and actually trying to do something with them. 100%. The, the mirror that you describe is, is actually a discovery. Uh, of oneself in order to to lead others and inspire others and and you know um you find true leaders are never looking for self gratification <laughs> you know they're, they're not and they, they can live very well without it right <laughs> they don't need right but you know they they care uh, and i think that we've got to get back to caring and and managing our people for better outcomes you know um you know i remember being a leader and someone said i want your job i said you can take it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? by all means <laughs> you know um it's absolutely fine by me you know but, but there is a lot of work um i remember uh, many years ago when i was the ceo of uh, of a of a corporate us corporation we had 12 offices in Europe and I had a lot of work to do to take it out of the trenches and, and take it to major um, uh, profitability. Um, and one of the things I had to do address was the vision, mission, set of values, and mm -hmm. tone of voice and personality trait. And it was Julio, who was my director in Portugal at the time, and he said, Jeff, you know, what you've done, you haven't created an, uh, a brand refresh. What you've done is actually created a religion. And we and we're all a part of this, and we all want more of this. And and it was what what was one of the key factors in launch relaunching the business and taking the business to uh, ex extremities in terms of uh, overall revenue performance and profitability um, was the fact that we I created this ethos of of working together with the right mindset and the right behavior. Yeah, and we are, we, yeah, we, we're, we're transitioning now uh, to the to the workplace, which is which is also, I think, the uh, the next sort of uh, stage where I, I, I wanted to pick your brain, and especially uh, uh, from the book where where you're citing uh, a lot of research. Uh, there's especially one with uh, with Gallup, I guess, uh, that is uh, that is well known, and it's about you know engagement in the in the workplace, and there are just yep. really bad bad results that you can uh, you can read there. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, phrase it. Yeah, you know, about thirty percent of people are committed, but about twenty percent, you know, they they shouldn't be there because they they're not they're really detrimental to uh, to the company. And I've looked at the Hungarian results, and and uh, actually it's about eleven uh, percent uh, committed, and almost three times twenty nine percent who are really you know detrimental to to the company, very disengaged. And I think that's not an HR problem; that's a CEO problem. And you you can't you know just have uh, to weekend training to uh, to deal with that. But how how do you create that that workplace uh, engagement? How how do you start you know really uh, telling employees that hey, uh, I trust you, uh, I trust what what you are doing, and 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 create that kind of of, of company culture and engagement. So the first, let's talk about trust because I think the the trust aspect is is really interesting. It's crucial, yeah. We 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 when I say we, I B E M, we committed uh, to a um, to a very interesting um, trust report. Um, which was actually commissioned not by Gallup, by a company called Datapad. Uh, and within Datapad, uh, we we basically got them to do this survey because we felt it was important to our work. 
um, interesting enough, uh, well, no big surprise, actually, but it was scary. The findings was that 69 percent of all people that were interviewed um, did not trust their line manager or CEO. Um, so this was even before the pandemic. OK, so, you know, when you start looking at that, you, you start sort of saying, OK, there is a trust issue. Um, it's, it's a trust issue. As I said earlier, there are key factors to that. And, and within trust, you know, you, you, we, we kind of define the trust framework. Um, we call it uh, trust genesis, which sort of covers a lot, a lot of factors. And um, the culture piece, which I think is absolutely paramount. Mm -hmm. there are very, as I said before, very few companies have actually dealt with the trust piece successfully. Um, they just, or, or the culture piece, because they they just say, there's your desk, there's your performance. Very few people actually, you know, do proper appraisals, actually spend time with people, actually engaging people for a better outcome. What they don't realize is that, you know, companies with, with a decent uh, culture framework or culture canvas um, have a stronger ability to engage emotionally with people and more importantly have a higher percentage and level of output and productivity um it's kind of go back goes back to why companies should be looking at design thinking you know i had I, we had a meeting yesterday uh both douglas and i and we were we were talking and, and they were saying oh yes we're we're dealing with the marketing strategy and, mm -hmm. and i said my first reaction was well okay can we talk about business strategy oh well we haven't done that well, you, you kind of can't do the marketing piece without actually doing the business strategy. And if you're going into business strategy, you've got to be starting to think about the design thinking around corporate strategy first. And, and the culture canvas is a huge component of the design thinking. Um, companies that actually do the design thinking the design modeling and the culture canvas as, as a piece of work will find that they don't have the problems so the day-to-day problems are always around but the sort of big problems of like the great resign and the emotional engagement that we saw the emotional engagement into what we're doing because they do listen because the leadership today is very different than what was 10 years ago. And just because you were doing something 10 years ago in a certain direction, it doesn't mean it's going to work today. Oh, yeah. We, we've had to, um, good leaders, solid leaders, understand Darwin very well. The, you know, it's not the strongest of species that survives. It's the one that's more adaptable to change. And, and you know, uh, I, I've always had that philosophy where, you know, um, continuous improvement, kind zen. Um, but more importantly, culture canvas is you, you wouldn't lead without understanding who your people are. More importantly, the, the person that puts their hand up at the room and you just dismiss them for their ideas and dismiss them because they, they don't have anything important to say because they're not a senior director or a senior manager. Those days are over. You, know, you, oh, yeah. you want you've got to build inclusion you've got to build inclusion and i actually think that's a very good thing to do i remember you know the last ceo role i had you know i used to do the coffee run my secretary would be like let me get your coffee no 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 no, no i will get my coffee mm -hmm. and it, it, was, it was deliberate that i would go to the coffee machine but i would talk to anyone and everyone find out what they were doing find out whether they were happy or not find out what their problems were what their bottlenecks were and, and there were two reasons for that one when my when my directors came to me i could probably tell them what was wrong <laughs> <laughs> right but but more importantly it was more important it was engaging with others and and that effect that ripple effect that can have within the organization is incredibly important but employee engagement never never been more important and I, i'd like to add that to inclusion and i would like to say that if companies don't have a proper uh, culture canvas you need to start a a s a p and that 20 percent that you talked about earlier of the wrong people in the organization doesn't surprise me if you don't actually really know who you're employing and it, you know people development plans are incredibly important as well you know you know how can you run a business without that because yeah. you know someone said to me the other day oh we, yeah we've got an employee survey well how was the survey actually commissioned um oh it's web-based well really it's not worth the paper it's written on 
you know, you, how are you going to use that data to actually build employee engagement and mo- better motivation and better buy into the company brand and value systems without really truly understanding? Uh, what are you saying, Jeff? Are you saying that we've got to talk to every member of staff? Yes. Years ago, years ago, I don't know if you remember, but the British Post Office, you know, had new management. And and I remember doing a piece of work with them a very long time ago. I think it was 1999, 1998, by, by call. The CEO wanted to go to every post office uh, logistics depot office and me everybody absolutely now that that was then now they're like oh standoffish no engage with your people Mm -hmm. and and inspire your people be a leader you know you you've taken the role and it's an honor and a privilege as i said before but execute as a leader too look it's not easy being a CEO and and but you're doing it because you love what you do and um, you equally need your people to engage in your philosophy and that's why emotional intelligence has become more important because they want leaders that have got philosophy that that how that philosophy can actually be communicated to to your to your people and that the people buy it into that that's why they're there it's yeah, and we, you know, yeah, we, we we think very much alike about that one. And actually, my uh, my new book just came out. Uh, it's in Hungarian, but in English, the uh, title is "Corporate Guerrillas." I'm trying to say that you know that yeah, you don't have to be uh, a leader in title in order to have a, a huge influence in the company. And if if you 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 are a leader, you are a CEO, you better know those people in 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 the organization because especially the uh, you know the experimentation piece. You know these people are very dedicated to to push the uh, the the, the boundaries and, and to take the, uh, the the organization to the next level and uh, it's easy to recognize them they are very frustrated at the same time because of the corporate red tape and 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 most of the time but if you can enable them to uh, to do that kind of of, of, of job that that can really help to 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 thrive uh, the company and this brings me to to the last piece uh, when I was discovering your book uh, what struck me as well is the uh, the risk uh, and strategy piece in there because I think that was also very very important Uh, and uh, you know we are living in a VUCA world which is for those listeners who don't know that it's a a phrase that was invented by the military actually at a a US, US military school about 26 years ago and uh, our world is definitely becoming more volatile and certain uh, complex and ambiguous but CEOs have to accept these risks, uh, embrace uncertainty. You, you can't, you know, turn back time and go back into security and robust companies. You have to like fail forward, uh, and you and and even if if, if being a, a huge, large bureaucratic organization, that's not a fail-safe method to to just scale uh, forward. So, what what do you think? What's the uh, what's the biggest risk uh, today, uh, strategy-wise, and 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 what what would you suggest for for those leaders? Who are who are trying to to sort of discover uh, their their own uh, liabilities? So I think you talked about the CEOs. I'd like to take it to a stage further. I'd like it to take it to the executive board mm-hmm. um, because it was very interesting. I, I don't know if you saw the EY report, um, and it was basically based on April 2021 when the pandemic first hit. Uh, I'm afraid to say the EY report, um, astonishingly enough, uh, demonstrated that only 6% of global companies had actually got a, a uh, COVID-19 response plan okay, to, to their businesses and to their people. That is, and that's global, by the way. This is that's a global report. So, so I'm not talking right now about BCP, you know, business continuity planning. I'm talking about a response plan to the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, which is was was most probably one of the most serious things for people within an organisation or within a community. That tells me that the boards, the executive boards, or the composition of the boards and the subcommittees within the boards weren't actually set up. Uh, with with the right skills, um, with the right abilities to make these 
cause. It should have been the board's responsibility and with in conjunction with the CEO, um, you know, to deal with the risks that we're talking about. Um, there are many risks in the business, as you're probably aware. It's not just financial risk. It's not just the operational risk and uh, et cetera. It yeah, it can be a risk of, of, of not embracing talent or not retaining talent, for example. Exactly. And it can also be, why did we not consider cyber risk as a, as, as a bigger issue than it really was? So what you started to see was kind of audit committees morphing out with, we've now got a risk committee. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and look, I always laugh when I say say to an executive board, right, can you please give me an ex extrapolation or can you please show me a, a summary of, of the risk register? And they're like, risk register? <laughs> you know, so, so it's kind of like risk, risk is two things. Uh, risk is obviously something that you need to manage on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. And it's incredibly important that the board engage with the risk so that the ELT or the you know, um, are able to uh, manage things on a regular basis. However, um, however, I also see risk as opportunities as well. You know, you, oh, yes. you, ha you have to you have to look at that. So the question begs itself is, mm -hmm. is why are people not taking risks more serious than, than it really is? And and the risks are only going to become greater. And it is be able to be able to put the right preventional strategies in place that can be managed um, locally and in some uh, respects internationally um, by the executive board. Um, so if it requires um, a greater skill set at, at executive board level um, to manage that from the top down, um, but you should, you should be embracing everybody within the organization in the risk. And that's where that inclusion piece comes from. It's not just something that's reserved for the board. It should be something that everybody is acutely aware of. And, and more importantly, that we are object from an objective point of view, building risk into the objective so that we can improve those objectives. Right? So if I if I get you right, then then probably you know at the board level, you know, not having the, uh, the sort of diversity of thought is is a strategic risk uh, in and of itself, and and they they purposefully have to select people who are not you know mainstream and and might have uh, very unusual ideas and 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 are able to articulate those uh, those ideas and push it through we are one of the boards that i represent the only reason that i'm i'm there is because of uh, the chair the chair ladies um diversity on on thought and perspectives and knowing that she's got all the skills uh, at the executive board level that can make a better decision and, and, and in that respect, I, I'm, a, I'm a great advocate of looking at both gen, the gender bias, which you were all up against today. Um, diversity is a little bit more complicated at times, but certainly from a gender bias of male-female dynamic at board level, it actually is incredibly good at, at executive board level to have that because you look at things from completely different perspectives. And, and risk, I'm afraid, for me, risk has to be be a part of your culture today. Um, you know, it was a, it was kind of a difficult thing maybe 20 years ago, but now it's got to be a part of your everyday culture because the risks are bigger are greater, mm -hmm. and they, they have a, a much greater impact to, to the business day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And therefore, you need the people that can actually look at things from different perspectives and prescribe um, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, uh, the right strategies for, for taking the business forward. Yeah, thank you for that. We are coming to the end, uh, but before my last question, I, I, I just wanted to articulate again, you know, that probably the uh, the thing that I like best in, in your book is, is that you are mentioning this uh, over and over again, but you, you're saying that you must embrace change or get left behind. And I think that's a great message, which very much aligns with the Academy for Leading Change uh, that, that, that we are running here at, at MCC, because uh, uh, actually training uh, leaders who are able to deal with, uh, with the constantly uh, disruptive environment and change is absolutely necessary. So uh, what does leadership look like in the new world and, and, and we operate within today? And what tips would you recommend for bilateral relationships and strategic positioning of partnerships? and international growth. For example, we are in Hungary here, and, and let's say we want to build some, some, some uh, partnerships. Would you, what, what would you be your, your, your recommendation for, for business people? So 
I want to go back to the first comment you made and you used the word disruption, mm -hmm. right? And, and what the last 24 months, 30 months has given us is it's disrupted everything. It's that leadership needed to step up. And I know I'm just talking about CEOs and C-suite. I'm talking about executive board, including myself. I had to step up. And that was through learning and development and uh, engaging um, the trends and, and the marketplace. Uh, what I'm really talking about is there needs to be a reinvention of authority, right? So I think that, you know, you know where we've had um, surveys demonstrating weaknesses in, in, in leadership, what needs to be done is to, for leaders to actually put their hand up and, and for them to understand that they don't have the skills. Mm, yeah. And, and that takes a lot of courage, right? It better to, you've got, okay. So for me, you, as a leader, a part of your DNA has to be courageous leadership because you've got to be able to make good decisions. And that also means if I'm not the right person for the role, I need to be able to put my hand up and go to the board and say, I think we should be looking at some succession planning in my role because I can't manage at the level that we've already seen mental health uh, issues, not just around everyday isolation issues, but around the, the leadership's inability to be able to lead at the highest level. I'm afraid to say, when I look at leadership in, in corporations or and companies, you've got to be able to have the skills. You've got to be able to execute those skills. You've got to be able to make good decisions that steers the business into chartered waters mm -hmm. of success. And that reinvention of authority that I talk about is about stepping up. You have to step up. Now, look, there's a cost of confidence as well. Um, you, you know, leadership needs to instill confidence within its people, um, its C-suite people, its executive people. And there is a cost to that. Um, but from a philosophical point of view, it's, it's, the, it's the leadership's role to be able to instill confidence in its people because you need to be able to overcome adversity, overcome the challenges that we're talking about. I go back to trust. And, and, you know, earlier I talked a little bit about the genesis of trust. Um, but what, is, what, is, what does that really mean? I mean, I'm talking about organizational trust. I'm talking about market trust. I'm mm -hmm. talking about social trust. I'm talking about relationship trust. More importantly, I'm talking about self-trust, which sort of dovetails into what we're saying. You've got to be a courageous leader. You've got to have that self-trust. You've got to have that belief system. What comes out of that? If you've if you look at look at um, a framework of things that can come out of what I've just described, you're going to look at an increased level of um, increased value. You're going to look at accelerated growth. You're going to look at enhanced innovation, improved collaboration, stronger partnering, better execution, but most importantly, heightened loyalty. And that is what you need as a leader within your organization. And it deals with what we spoke earlier about employee engagement. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, that, those are some some great clothing thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff Hudson Seal on the Leadership Podcast. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. I, I could go on and on for hours with you. I've, uh, I've enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed this. I, I could do the same. <laughs> but thank you very much for uh, for taking the time and, and, and sharing your thoughts. And uh, for our listeners, I just wanted to let you know that uh, many of the things that uh, Jeff, Jeff has written earlier, uh, the books and, and uh, other books that he mentioned here, you can uh, read in the show notes later on. Thank you. Awesome. Pleasure. Thank you.